tell me if. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Professor Bish Sanyal from MIT's Comprehensive Initiative on Technology Evaluation Group. Welcome to the edX course in which you will learn how to assess technologies which have been used to design consumer products mainly used by the poor in developing countries. We begin with a historical overview of why and how evaluation of products such as solar lanterns or household water filters, which are used by individual households, how they became an important task for development practitioners. As we learn in this course, early development ideas were dominated by evaluations of much broader questions, such as whether a nation should pursue import substitution or export promotion as a development strategy. Or questions were asked about the best ways to create efficient labor markets, or whether technology, which is the focus of our inquiry, should be imported or domestically developed. In contrast to such macro questions, today many development practitioners are asking questions at the micro level, such as whether some portable household filters are better than others. Development practitioners today are often asked to compare the efficacy of microscale technologies and services, ranging from the delivery of mosquito nets to mobile banking. Suddenly, it seems, the development policy's focus has shifted from government to individuals, and from aggregate growth indicators to details regarding individual consumption. How did this change in policy research from macro to micro come about? We'll explore this question through a historical analysis of three key ideas, namely that of economic development, technological change, and poverty alleviation. You may ask, why focus on these three ideas? More importantly, you may also want to ask why one needs to think historically about these ideas to evaluate the efficacy of current technologies for the poor. To answer the first question, the three main ideas, that of economic development, technological change, and poverty alleviation, have evolved over time, shifting the concern of development practitioners from the macro to the micro level. If you don't understand the change in the focus, you may not be able to ask the right question to assess the relevance of technologies designed for the poor. For example, having a historical understanding of how the public sector performed in initiating large-scale public programs may help you better understand its contemporary role in advancing the kind of technologies you want to evaluate today. Second, a historical analysis will unearth the key assumptions that ultimately underlie the effort to design products for poverty alleviation. For instance, early developmental efforts assumed that rapid and large-scale industrialization, such as the creation of manufacturing capabilities and resource management, for example, like construction of dams for water management, they were expected to generate employment and raise income for the poor. These were predominantly state-led, large-scale efforts, which are expected to help the poor to trickle-down method. We have come a long way from such assumptions. For example, we now know that the benefits of conventional industrialization often do not reach the poor quickly. Technologically speaking, this means that industrialization efforts of the old kind did not necessarily lead to immediate economic benefits for the poor. For instance, large dams intended for socially useful water management often did not provide good quality water to poor people in surrounding areas. Third, our perceptions of the poor, what their priorities and preferences are, what constraints they work with, their purchasing power, what their capabilities are, what they value in their lives and so on has changed. In the past, development strategies assumed the poor as passive, 
ignorant and need of help. In contrast today, the product approach to poverty alleviation assumes the poor to be market savvy consumers with clear and distinct preferences. However, when you evaluate a product at the micro level, can you really assess the efficacy of any particular technology without asking larger macro level questions? For instance, if a village lacks any medical facilities, how meaningful will it be to evaluate which self-diagnosis malaria kit work better? By this time, it must strike you that there are contending definitions of concepts such as economic development, technological change, and poverty alleviation. Let us clarify these concepts. This is important because the evaluations that you will conduct will ultimately rest on your definitions of these concepts. For now, our definitions will be brief because we'll return to them in greater detail in later lectures. In the early phase of development ideas, after World War II, economic development was mainly defined as wealth creation quantified by metrics such as gross national product. Later, however, a much broader, more human-centered definition emerged. This new definition focused on broad-based human development indicators rather than just economic growth. Similarly, the assessment of technological change has also undergone a significant change in interpretation. In early development efforts, technological change meant moving from human and animal-powered agriculture to mechanization and industrialization. The idea was that mechanization, which relied on modern machineries, would increase productivity, thereby increasing the gross national product. A couple of decades later, after developing countries started large-scale industrialization, their emphasis of technological change shifted from large to small-scale appropriate technologies embodied in products that were low cost and therefore affordable, easy to use and repair, and therefore more accessible to the majority of the poor. In early developmental thinking, poverty meant a lack of purchasing power. Therefore, poverty alleviation was understood as a way to increase in incomes of the poor. Along with the broadening of the definition of development itself, the understanding of what is effective poverty alleviation strategy has changed too. Today, poverty alleviation means both the increase in income for the poor and the expansion of their human capabilities, both physical capabilities, such as living in a healthy life, as well as political capabilities, such as freely, freely participating in democratic politics. With these definitional clarifications, let us now turn to our main question. Why spend time learning from history when you can spend your time and energy learning hard skills for rigorous evidence-based evaluations? Thinking historically is a skill too. Not only is it a skill, it is one of the most important skills if your goal is to address a long-standing problem. Through historical analysis, we come to understand how we define problems, what motivated our past actions, and what are the lessons to be drawn, particularly regarding implementation challenges so as to craft effective new policies. Since you are ultimately interested in implementing development policies, it is essential that you understand the conceptual interconnections between the different key ideas of economic development, poverty alleviation, and technological change. Historical analysis, if conducted well, and from the point of view of practitioners, will help you to evaluate your own understanding of your own ideology. This reflexivity is the most important skill needed to be a good practitioner. Because development problems are wicked problems which do not have simple and easy answers. Importantly, we want to highlight that this lecture, we want to introduce you to thinking historically about global development. It is not about the history of evaluation as a technique for public policy. For example, we are not going to discuss whether traditional cost-benefit analysis is better than randomized control trials. Instead, we begin by more fundamental questions. Sometimes, rather than asking how to evaluate a product, a more appropriate question may be 
to assess whether the product-centered approach is the best way to achieve poverty alleviation, or are there radically different other approaches necessary? Let me illustrate this using an example. Assume that portable water for the poor is the goal. You may be given to evaluate a number of portable water filters available on the market and decide which one best suits the needs of the poor. This is an important question. However, thinking historically and conceptually about interconnections, you may come to realize that this question is rather limited, particularly if your goal is to create large-scale social impact. For instance, the focus on portable water filters implies that we are not asking whether cheap and portable water provided by municipal authorities could be a more sustainable solution. Similarly, another assumption behind the question of water filters is that the poor are inclined to use them. Again, thinking historically, you will see that this is based on a particular understanding of motivations of poor people. How come the previously ignorant poor are now suddenly assumed to be informed consumers? In this regard, the research conducted by Comprehensive Initiative on Technology Evaluation at MIT has shown that many poor women in urban India choose to purify water using folded saris, even though water filters are available in the market. In addition, research showed that even though the same sari method actually did not purify the water and in fact contaminated the water further from the dyes used in the saris, the poor women still continue to use it. Why do we then assume that people in this case, poor people, will suddenly change their life practices just because new products are available on the market? In summary, we want to reiterate that a purposive understanding of history will give you a special skill of approaching and appreciating how development ideas have evolved. This is not to say that all changes in developmental thinking have had positive impact. You need to think critically about such changes, drawing so as to not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Changing context requires appreciation of change has happened in the first place, for that historical understanding is the key. Now with these lessons in mind, we welcome you to join us in a historical journey of how small-scale technologies and their evaluations become popular strategies. There is much about technology evaluations from the past we can learn from. We have divided the content into eight sessions in addition to this one. A quick synopsis of what follows. Session two will go in further depth on the three key topics, namely economic development, technological change, and poverty alleviation. In session three, we'll describe how the early development goals, the strategies were sharply different in focus. In session four and five, we'll highlight the actual outcome of these developmental strategies and review the criticism of these early efforts. After covering this early period of development history, in session six, we'll discuss the appropriate technology model and its emergence as an alternative development paradigm. In seven, session seven, we continue on the same topic, describing the rise and eventual decline of the appropriate technology model. In the last two classes of this model, we'll explore the recent re-emergence of appropriate technologies as a development strategy. In session eight, we'll discuss why this once discredited idea re-emerged again on the development agenda, perhaps with a different understanding of economic development, technological change, and poverty alleviation. In session nine, we'll discuss why this re-emergence has created oversupply of consumer products intended for use by the poor. In this last class, we focus specifically on explaining why now, more than any time in recent history, we need better technology evaluations. May that be for either better procurement by the governments during emergencies, or to help the poor make better purchasing decisions with their limited income. All along, our focus will only be on changing development ideas, but also changing evaluation strategies from cost-benefit analysis, which marked early development efforts, to the current evaluation approach of MIT's comprehensive initiative on technology evaluation, about which we learn in this course. How did such changes come about, and are they all good? 
These are the types of questions you want to think about as you listen to these lectures. And thank you for listening.